my name is Robert Dalton Harris. Uh, I have, uh, and our speaker is Martin Norton, Marty Norton, from U UMass Amherst. I had a, uh, a notorious uh, escapade at UMass and Amherst some 40 years ago, uh, when in the conjunction with pre uh, performing a mail art show there, a friend and I vandal vandalized the uh, billboards in the student union. We have them, we took out the entire billboards down as a record of the ephemera of the time. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. Martin Norton is going to talk about this history of cinema, silent film era, involving women more than 100 years ago. And the, uh, the object of interest is uh, Lois Weber, Weber. Weber. Uh, whose prominent uh, or controversial films, 1916 and 1917, focused on women's reproductive rights, recalling Margaret Sanger of that period, who was jailed for proposing reproductive rights for women. It has been a long time that women have been arguing over the control of their bodies in cinema. Uh, and today, uh, uh, although that's what I can bring in terms of this, I'm sure that Marty is going to tell us much more than uh, about cinema and women and Lois Weber than that. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Very glad that you're here. As, as Robert mentioned, I'm based at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I am a film history professor. Um, I'm interested in all phases of movie history, but I'm particularly interested in what was happening in Hollywood uh, roughly 100 years ago, what was happening in the 19-teens and 1920s. And the more I explored that time period, the more that I learned that there's at least one person who has been significantly overlooked. Her name is Lois Weber. She's the focus of my presentation today. Um, She's a really good example of that old cliche of women's history tending to be erased. You probably heard that. The idea that uh, historians have tended to overlook the contributions of women. Here's a, here's a really good illustration of that point. Her great contemporary was someone named D.W. Griffith, who you probably heard of. His most infamous movie is Birth of a Nation from 1915. She was just as prolific as a filmmaker as he was. She made hundreds of movies during the teens and 20s. I'd say she was just as influential a filmmaker as Griffith was. But if you look at a typical movie history textbook, Griffith will get a full chapter. Weber is lucky to get a paragraph, more likely a sentence or two. And yet she made hundreds of movies, uh, first in the New York City area and then eventually in California. Uh, so it's been my self-appointed mission to <laughs> educate people about who she was and, and the work that she uh, did. So my, my presentation today will, will focus on telling her story in images. Uh, I've collected, uh, with the help of many other scholars, I've collected images of movie posters that you know, promoted her films and slides that might have been shown in movie theaters as coming attractions and that kind of thing that, that heralded her work. Uh, so we'll get a pretty good idea of the kind of films that she worked on, um, who she was and all that kind of stuff. So we'll uh, move along. Uh, the, the first couple of slides that I have are... Um, kind of heavy with text, and we'll, we'll kind of zip through these pretty quickly. Just a little bit of background information on who she was. Uh, born in 1879 in Allegheny City, uh, Pennsylvania, which is now, a, it's a part of Pittsburgh, but at the time it was a separate city. Uh, died 1939, age of 60. Um, I, as I mentioned here, she began working in the film industry around 1908. Uh, she was hired originally as a, as a performer, as an actress, but she showed a flair for writing as well as directing, and she quickly ascended to those uh, positions. And the image I have of her here is a publicity photo from a movie that she co-directed and adapted 
uh, The Merchant of Venice from 1914. Uh, as, a, as a kind of a side note, this is considered a feature-length film. It was a four-reel movie. And you know, back at this time period, movies were measured in reels as opposed to time, I guess, because there was variability depending on the strength of the projectionist arm. You know, it, was, it was really difficult to measure time you know, in the movies. So movies are typically measured in terms of foot lengths and reels. A typical movie back then might be a one-reeler movie. Uh, on screen, it would run roughly 12 to 15 minutes or thereabouts. This movie was a four-reel movie, roughly an hour long. Uh, she is considered to be the first woman to have directed a, a feature film, and it's, it's this. And she also appeared in, as you see her, as, as Portia. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, she's mainly known, uh, among the few people who know about her, uh, she's mainly known as a, as a director, directed hundreds of movies from 1910 to about 1934. Uh, this is an image, uh, like a publicity shot of her on the set of The Angel of Broadway, which was produced by Cecil B. DeMille's company back in 1927. Uh, uh, late in her career, after basically uh, institutional sexism basically took hold, and she basically found herself forced out of the business, she became known as the discoverer of new talent. Uh, in fact, the Universal Studio, for which she had worked for many years, uh, late in her career had recruited her to find uh, new talent. And here we see her posing with uh, one of her finds, the actress Billy Dove. And we'll, we'll see Billy in a couple of movie posters in just a couple of minutes. And, uh, and for me, this is, this is a, a, a moment to share with her, with you her perspective on working with actors and actresses. This is a direct quote from her. I fail to see how any director can prefer a man to a woman for a star. The average male is as, is as full of conceit as a lemon is of juice. And, <laughs> and I use the word lemon advisedly for comparison. Girls, however, seldom forget the part that their directors have had in their success and are correspondingly grateful. And I think that sentiment is very much expressed in this uh, image you see here. And, and I, I, I can't help but uh, talk a little bit about the context of that comment because it sounds so so harsh. Um, basically, the Universal Publicity Department set up this fake debate between Weber and her fellow director, a fellow by the name of Rupert Julian, who's perhaps best known for directing the Lon Chaney version of Phantom of the Opera in the 1920s, where you know she took the side of the actresses, he took the side of the actors. But as it turns out, they, they weren't rivals at all. In fact, Rupert Ju Julian, before he became a director, had acted in probably dozens, if not hundreds, of her films. I mean, they knew each other really well. So it was just sort of a fake kind of a debate that had been set up there. All right, let's keep moving along here. Um, at this point in my presentation, uh, I think we'll see a little bit of an overlap uh, with, with the presentation that, that Pat gave a little while ago on uh, early uh, theatrical touring groups. Before Weber broke into uh, the filmmaking business, she spent a few years um, in, in doing live entertainment. Um, and this is a, a not very good reproduction. I apologize for that. It's probably a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. So the quality is not good. But let me, let me explain what this represents. Uh, in 1903, when Weber was in her early to mid-20s, she went on a brief tour with a fellow named Valentine Abt. You can see his name there, A-B-T, right under the, his portrait. At the time, he was quite well known as a mandolinist and a harpist. And he, the two of them went on a brief tour, mainly in, in Indiana and Kentucky and, and sort of in the central part of the country. Uh, it, was, it was a fairly short tour, just a couple of months long, but I found several newspaper references. Uh, to their work. Uh, Abt is listed as the, the, the uh, mandolinist and harpist, and right under his name you see Florence Lois Weber, and then in quotations, the, the great soprano and pianist. Uh, she was quite talented as a singer and as a pianist, and uh, I don't think she was terribly famous at the time. He was, he was far better known than she was. 
And you'll notice that there's Florence attached to her name, too. Her, her birth name was actually Florence Lois Weber. But as it turns out, there was another person in the entertainment business at the time named uh, Florence Weber. And so I think she used her full name to try to distinguish herself from this other person. And then I think after a while, she just kind of gave up on her first name and just started calling herself by her middle name, uh, Lois. Um, during the second half of 1903, and make sure I got this right here, she latched on to a theatrical touring company called the Zigzag Alley Troupe and, uh, as a Corrine. And she, she, uh, this was a group that toured the upper Midwest and uh, the Northeast. And then in early, 2000, in, in early 1904, um, she joined uh, the Vance and Sullivan Company's uh, tour of a show called Why Girls Leave Home. It was a five-act musical melodrama written by Fred Summerfield. And this tour was a nationwide tour. It lasted a, at least two and a half years. And so she was on the road constantly from early 1904 to about mid uh, uh, 1906. So he's back in New York City at the time, uh, growing pretty restless. She had married one of her colleagues <laughs> uh, in, in the troupe, and he continued uh, on other theatrical tours, and she was sort of left behind um, in New York City. I, was think, I think she was getting kind of anxious and wanting to get back into showbiz. And she had heard about a company called the American Gaumont Company, uh, Chronophone Company, based in Flushing, New York. It was an, an American branch of a French filmmaking company called Gaumont. And uh, this was a company that, in America, was specializing in the creation of these short little, what were called chronofilms. These were maybe five-minute-long vaudeville productions that would attempt to have synchronized sound attached to them. I mean, we tend to think of this time period as the silent film era, but I think it's important to remember that movies were never shown silently back then. There was always some kind of musical accompaniment. And all during the teens and all during the 20s, various experimenters were looking for ways of synchronizing sound and image. It didn't all happen in 1927 with the jazz singer. Obviously, there's a lot of progression leading up to that moment. So anyway, she, she basically got her start in the film business working for this company called the American uh, Gaumont Chronophone Company, uh, first as a performer, and then she you know began writing these very short little films. And we're talking about movies that at most would be five minutes long, more likely a minute long or two minutes, fairly, fairly, because I think that you know the synchronization would go, you know the soundtrack would go out of synchronization pretty quickly, and they, they couldn't afford to have these longer kinds of productions. Uh, this is around 1908 that she uh, uh, began working on these very short films. Um, around that, I think after about a year or so of that, she briefly latched on to the what was called the Biograph Company. Uh, she may have crossed paths with D.W. Griffith at that point. I'm not really certain. That was the company that he had worked for for many years before becoming an independent um, filmmaker. We really know very little about her filmmaking career during this time. It really isn't until 1911 when she began working for um, uh, a company called Rex, spelled R-E-X, uh, a company formed in that year, 1911, by a person named Edwin S. Porter. And if the name Edwin S. Porter rings a bell, it's because you've probably seen a movie he made in 1903 called The Great Train Robbery, really famous uh, movie. That, that was when Edison was working, or I'm sorry, that was when Porter was working for the Edison Company. Uh, he formed his own company in 1911, simply called Rex. Uh, its, its trademark was the, uh, the, the crown that you see at the top of this image here. Uh, she uh, began working for Porter and this company uh, in early 1911. Uh, her husband, who, uh, named Philip Smalley, was also a, an actor and a director, and the two of them collaborated on many films uh, for, for uh, this company called Rex. Uh, what I find so astounding is that during this phase of her career, she was acting in films, uh, directing them, writing them. There was a period in her life when during a three-year stretch, she wrote, directed, acted in, titled, and edited 
one film per week without a break. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the way television is produced, I guess. I mean, the idea that uh, the studio had this contractual obligation with its theaters to, to have one Weber film per week. You know, every Thursday, a Lois Weber film would be released. And so that was her responsibility to be, I mean, she was the head of her own filmmaking company. And, and her responsibility was to star in, write, direct, edit, all that kind of stuff, one film per week. And again, films back then were relatively short. I mean, typically we're talking about a one-reeler film, you know, 12 to 15 minutes long. But just that a pretty big responsibility, I, I'd say. The reason I wanted to show you this image, and again, it's, it's kind of a grainy image, not a not very good reproduction, but it's, it's an advertisement for a, um, a Rex film that she starred in and wrote and directed called The Heiress. What's a little bit unusual about this advertisement is that she's identified in it. I mean, at the very bottom, uh, her name is there, and, you know, it says Lois Weber as, as the heiress. At the time, it was extremely unusual for movie companies to name their performers, whether in advertisements or in the actual films. If you've ever seen any movies from, say, the, the, the early 19-teens, movies during the, you know, the first decade or two, um, it'd be pretty unusual to see any actors' names. And, the, and it, it, it <laughs> boils down to economics. The, the studio heads were reluctant to name their performers uh, because they thought it meant they'd have to pay them higher salaries. <laughs> and so, and so it, it, the, the practice was not to mention the names of performers, either in ads or in films. It really took a few years before movie companies realized that audiences craved that. They wanted to know who these people were. You know, the whole notion of fan magazines really hadn't developed yet. Uh, so this, be this became kind of a revelation, I think, for movie companies that fans want to know the identities of their actors. But anyway, here's an early example of where the performer is actually identified. This is actually a pretty rare advertisement because of that. I get, you know, presumably Rex thought so highly of her that they wanted to highlight her in, in, her ad, in this ad. Um, this is another ad, this is a very busy kind of an ad. It appeared in a trade journal called Moving Picture World. Um, and it more clearly identifies the Rex company at the, at the bottom of the slide. Lois is way in the back in, in that group of people. It's just, uh, and I, I love that uh, tagline there, a revolution and a revelation. Uh, a movie called A Daughter of the Revolution that she appeared in, that she wrote and directed and, and, uh, and starred in. This would have been a little bit later in 1911. Um, um, this is a, a double-paged ad for that um, movie I referred to a little earlier called The Merchant of Venice. Uh, that's Weber's second on the left there in character as Portia. And uh, her husband... Uh, Philip Smalley is the heavily bearded fellow we see there, uh, Shylock. All right. So she had been working for Rex for quite a while. And around 1912, the company was absorbed into a brand new company called Universal, which we still have with us in a mutated form today. Uh, there was a person by the name of Carl Lemley, who uh, was instrumental in forming this brand new company. Basically, it, it, it involved merging maybe a half a dozen other smaller companies together, including uh, Rex. And so uh, the company basically got bought out by, by, by Universal. And so the subsequent films were identified as Universal Rex uh, productions. I think Universal was pretty interested in, in brand names and uh, you know her films for Rex had become pretty famous. But you know, she had, um, I don't know if it was exactly a falling out, or maybe it might have been a, uh, a financial dispute, I'm not really certain, but she uh, left Universal Rex around 1914 and took up with another company called Bosworth. And uh, what we have here is uh, an ad for her most famous movie, uh, for the Bosworth Company, a movie called Hypocrites. This was a, uh, a notorious film 
for its day. And, and one reason is that it features full female nudity in 1915. Uh, and as you might imagine, you know, there was, there was some controversy over this. I mean, uh, this film. You have to remember that at this time in movie history, movies were not protected by the First Amendment. Actually, that same year, 1915, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that movies were items of commerce. And that's all they were. Movies were items of commerce. They were not expressions of speech. And, and that opinion held sway for decades. It really wasn't until the 1950s where the Supreme Court finally reversed itself in a ruling in which they said, yes, movies should be protected by the First Amendment. I mention this because movies at this time, say from 1915 to the 1950s, uh, were highly subject to censorship. Just about every city, every town, quite a few states had their own censorship boards. And say a, a, a movie, like say Hypocrites, the version showing in Boston might be a very different version from the film showing in Chicago because uh, different standards would apply. There was no uniformity in terms of who would be the censoring authority. I know in the city of Boston, the mayor served as the censoring authority, whereas in Chicago, it was the police board. In my hometown of Amherst, Massachusetts, it was the three-person select board who would serve as the uh, censoring. So there was no consistency in terms of how movies were regulated. But again, movies highly subject to censorship back then. Um, here's, I have a couple of still images from the film that will give you kind of a sense of what this film was about. Um, it's, it's a complex narrative. It features two intertwined narratives, one set in modern day, another set in medieval times. And the movie kind of alternates between the two. Uh, it, it focuses on a modern-day minister who also plays a monk. And you see him in the background in his monk's garb. Um, he, a, as the modern-day minister, he's very concerned about social hypocrisy, uh, about how people pretend to be people that they're not, and so on. And, and actually, that became a major theme in many of Weber's films, uh, social hypocrisy. We'll see that repeating a couple of times. Um, and then uh, there's also the, the same actor uh, plays this medieval monk who, after unveiling a statue of a naked woman titled The Naked Truth is Stoned to Death. But he reappears, he's sort of reincarnated in modern day, and he has this figure of the naked truth, this young woman we see here, accompany him through the modern day um, uh, Settings. You should know that uh, the, the actress who plays the naked woman, the naked truth, at no point in the production process appeared naked with other actors. She was always photographed separately, and then her image superimposed here, as you can probably see. And um, here's a, a, different, uh, a different image from the film. If, if time allows today, at the end of my presentation, uh, I'll show you a brief clip from this movie. It's, I mean, it's one thing to see still photos and quite another, I think, to see the actual moving images. And you might be wondering, what exactly is she holding there? She's actually holding a hand mirror. And you know, she, at various points in the movie, holds that hand mirror up to members of society uh, to reveal them as they really are. Weber was inspired by, by a painting she had seen that had been produced the previous year. This is a, a French painting. The, the painter is uh, named Adolphe, um, did I get the name right? Uh, Faugeron, Adolphe Faugeron in 1914 created this painting called La Verite, or The Truth. And I'm guessing that Weber had seen a newspaper reproduction of this painting. So what we have here is a naked woman holding up a hand mirror, just like we saw in, that, in those uh, frame blow-ups. And, and the adults in the picture are turning away. They, they can't bear the thought of, of, this, of, 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 this, you know, of their reflection, basically. They can't bear the thought that they're being shown as they really are. You know, because 
the naked truth has nothing to hide. You know, so she's using her mirror to expose social hypocrisy. What I find so interesting about this painting is that in addition to the adults turning away, there are some children in the image too. We see in the, in the lower right-hand corner, we see a little, little girl or a little boy who's, not, who's really interested, you know, who's, who's paying a lot of attention to uh, the, 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 the mirror that's being held up. And way in the background, that rock outcropping, there are a couple of uh, young people who are also not turning away. They're, they're paying attention. So perhaps Fogeron is suggesting that maybe the, the current adult generation is pretty hopeless, but maybe there's some hope you know, for, the, for the younger people. So it, that, that movie, Hypocrites, is an example of a film inspired by a painting. It was actually inspired by this uh, 1914 a painting. And it was a movie that was shown around the world, um, as you might imagine, censored in places. Uh, it, it was a difficult film for her to have um, exhibited. Um, her career with, Weber's career with um, Bosworth didn't last too long. I mean, the, the terms that she and her husband received at Bosworth were quite generous. It was, you know, they, they received a combined salary of $500 a week, which was a substantial amount of money back then, and half of all the profits that their films made. But uh, Bosworth was a startup company. And I don't think, I think there's a lot of fiscal mismanagement there. And I think Weber and her husband eventually sued the company and they wanted to demand an accounting, you know, of, of the profits. And, all. and so she eventually returned back to Universal, her, her, her home, her home base. Uh, and was now directing feature-length films for Universal. This would have been around 1916. The image you see here is uh, a, a very posed shot uh, for a movie that she was making around that time called The Dumb Girl of Portici. What's interesting about this film is that it feature, it's the only full-length film that features the performance of Anna Pavlova, who at the time was probably the most famous dancer on the planet. Uh, she, and that's, and you see her seated there. Uh, Weber is in the long dress standing right next to her, but the seated woman is Anna Pavlova, a very famous dancer uh, from the time period. Uh, what's intriguing too is that this, this dumb girl of Portici uh, was based on an opera, and you might wonder, how can a silent film be based on an opera? What kind of a film is that going to be like? Well, as it turns out, it was not unusual for movies back then to have orchestral scores written for them, particularly the big budgeted feature length films, not unusual. As I mentioned before, movies were never shown silently. At the very least, there would be a pianist or an organist. In the case of the bigger productions, there would be a full orchestra. You know? so, so although you, know, you might wonder, silent film? based on an opera, but you know, there, there was a musical score that had been prepared for it. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a production image. Um, you'll see a reference to Madame Pavlova at the bottom there. Universal City, California. It was a, uh, a municipality set up by Universal, uh, and the inhabitants were strictly people who worked for the studio. So if you've ever heard of Inter Universal City, that's what that's referring to. This is one of the studios there. Uh, I, it, it, to me, it, it illustrates uh, how movies got shot back then. It's, it's important to remember that film stock back then, the actual material that ran through the camera, was relatively insensitive to light. And what that meant was that when movies were being shot, the sets had to be flooded with light in order to get a usable image. You know, the idea of low key lighting and low lighting, uh, it wouldn't have worked back then. And so I think one reason why Southern California became such a popular place to shoot films is because of the abundant year-round sunshine. So what we have here is kind of like a pavilion when you, when you look at it more closely. The ceiling, uh, the roof, is actually made out of glass. And uh, you know, it, technically it's an outdoor setting, but oftentimes the, you know, what passes for interior scenes in movies shot back then were actually shot out of doors. That would be not unusual. And here they're just basically taking full advantage of, of, of the California uh, sunlight in the making of that, of that film. Um, that's Pavlova in, in a rather grisly scene. From, uh, we see the heads mounted on pikes back then. But that's a scene from that same movie, uh, the, the Dumb Girl of um, Weber became known as a person interested in exploring 
uh, social issues. Her, her, her films were not lightweight films by, by any means. She was really interested in exploring various social ills. This film called Hot the Devil's Brew takes a look at opium addiction. 1916, movie on, on addiction. Where, and she plays the, the wife, I think, of a college professor who becomes addicted to opium. And, and he's unaware of all of this. And you know, eventually there's a, an understanding and she survives and everything. But uh, an, an early attempt to deal with drug addiction in, in movies. And this is a, uh, an advertisement for the same film but it's handled differently, as you can see. And, and the text on the left is far too small for you to read. I'll, I'll tell you what it is, though. It's basically a narrative summary of the entire film. It's loaded with, with what we today call spoilers. The entire film is given away in the text that you see on the left there. And you might wonder, why would they do that? Well, you have to remember, as I mentioned before, that movies were highly subject to censorship back then. It would not be unusual for a censorship board in a given city or town to say, we'll allow you to show that film if you remove scenes X, Y, and Z out of the film. And so the result might be a very fragmentary film, very choppy kind of a film, where huge sections might have been lopped out at the request of the censors. Uh, and so this would be uh, a production company's way of trying to get around that problem in case audience members were left wondering, why is there so much missing information? They could, they could kind of fill in the blanks by, by reading this information. And, and you know, if, you, if you've looked at newspapers from the time, uh, you would see that it's not unusual for these spoiler-laden summaries to be printed in newspapers maybe a week or two ahead of the film's actual exhibition in that city. Um, so, uh, to me, I'm not quite certain if audience members would read these things before they set foot into the theater, or if they would show some restraint and wait until after they've seen the movie, and then, and I, I'm not really certain. Um, but it's, 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 it's an interesting way around that censorship issue, because newspapers were protected by the First Amendment, but, but movies were not. Um, this is a, a, a newspaper advertisement that appeared in the Boston Globe for, I would say, Weber's most famous movie called Where Are My Children, starring Tyrone Power, Tyrone Power Sr., who uh, at the time was famous as a Shakespearean stage actor uh, and had acted in a couple of movies for, for Universal, including this one. It's a movie that deals with birth control and abortion, and as, uh, as uh, Robert mentioned earlier, uh, in, in New York State in 1916, you could be thrown in jail for distributing birth control information because that was considered obscene material back then. And so um, in this particular movie, uh, Tyrone Power plays a district attorney. And we see him at the beginning of the movie uh, prosecuting a physician for giving out birth control information. Um, later on in the film, um, a young woman who lives in his household, you know, she's the daughter of his housekeeper, becomes pregnant and decides to have an abortion. And the abortionist botches the job and she dies. Um, and so this district attorney prosecutes the abortionist. And by the way, they wouldn't have used the, the word abortion back then. The, the common um, word used back then was malpractice. Like say, if a doctor performed abortions back then, they would, would have been called malpractitioners back then. Um, so this district attorney prosecutes this malpractitioner. And as the doctor is being led out of the courtroom, he yells, you know, see to your own home. And, 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 and the attorney doesn't know what that means. He looks through some of the uh, record books that the doctor had left in the courtroom as a part of the trial and discovers that uh, his own wife has been having abortions behind his back. Hence the title of the movie, where, I, where he's basically he's confronting his wife there who, uh, uh, you know, 
has been having these abortions, but without telling him. Um, this was an extremely popular movie. It played around the world. I, I discovered that it played in at least 25 countries around the world, at least 25 countries. And Universal was pretty um, cagey in the way it uh, promoted the film. Like this particular ad is pretty sensationalistic. But in the vast majority of other advertisements for this film, you would see quotations from local um, civic leaders, uh, quotations from local ministers and rabbis and, and quotations from police commissioners and the mayor and that kind of thing. What, what they would typically do is they would arrange a sneak preview of this film, maybe a week ahead of the film's main showing in a given city. And, the, and this early showing would be meant just for this private audience made up of local civic leaders. And uh, uniformly, you know, they would endorse the film. They could see that this is not a sensationalistic movie, uh, really, at all. Everything's quite veiled in this film. Uh, but um, I think Universal could see that, on the one hand, we're dealing with a film that deals with sexual issues. There's going to be a lot of interest in it, particularly when theaters say no one under the age of 16 is admitted. Whenever I think whenever people would see that kind of listing, it immediately meant, oh, we should go see this movie. And I don't think theater owners back then were very, monitored the ages of people terribly carefully back then. So on the one hand, the, movies, the movie was somewhat salacious. But on the other hand, they, made, they took pains to show that this is a moral movie. And, and all of you know, the, the, the local police commissioner and, and the mayor and the select board all approve this movie. You know. And so you would see those endorsements in typical, you don't see it here, but in, 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 in the majority of advertisements for this film, you would see that um, uh, type of endorsement. Um, here on out, we'll be seeing a lot of uh, in color um, posters uh, that promoted her films. Uh, a little bit later that same year, 1916, is a movie called The Eye of God, also starring uh, Tyrone Power. Weber herself appears in this film. Uh, it's a crime film. It basically, it's about this uh, kind of down and out guy. I think, he, I think he's a farmer, if I'm not mistaken, the character played by uh, Tyrone Power. And he becomes intrigued by the, the daughter of his landlord and uh, who's engaged to another man. And uh, there, there's, I forget what the circumstances were, but at one point he shoots two men, one of whom is, is the fiance who survives. Uh, the, the murder of the other man is pinned on the fiance, but you know the eye of God is on this guy, and he eventually realizes that he has to come forward and confess the crime um, uh, to, to this woman he's enamored of. Um, and just to give you an idea of how posters would have been used, and I'm sure you know a lot of this already. Uh, this is a, an image from uh, the city of Toronto where uh, the, the Eye of God was playing at a local theater. And you can see posters were huge back then. This would be a major way for a theater to you know, promote its uh, uh, films. Um, also in 1916, uh, Weber made a movie called Shoes, which deals with poverty and the effects of poverty, another social issue for Weber to explore. Um, it stars a person named Mary McLaren, who had played a bit part in Where Are My Children? And, and Weber just appreciated her performing abilities so much that she basically gave her this starring role uh, in this movie. So this would have been 1916. Uh, in this film, she plays a shop girl. She works at a, at a, a dime store and just makes just a couple of dollars a week. Living in poverty, her her father, who we see here in this hand tinted uh, um, publicity photo, is unemployed. Her her mother I, earns just a few cents per week as a laundress. I mean, the family is in dire financial straits, uh, and she desperately needs a new pair of shoes. And so, to raise money for that, she agrees to sleep with a guy. Uh, solely to raise money so that she can buy herself a pair of shoes. Uh, she does have a boyfriend, as you can see here, but he's, I think, in, in a similar economic circumstance as, as she is. Uh, she loves him, but he's poor as well, whereas the fellow she sleeps with is, a, I think he's a, like a pop singer and making lots of money and so on. And so she's able to, uh, 
partially buy her way out of poverty by sleeping. This is from a, a, a movie that came out, I think, in the latter part of 1916. I mean, she was turning these movies out pretty, and these are all feature films at this point in her career. This was a movie called Idle Wives, Idle Wives. And what's kind of interesting about this film is that it actually has a movie within a movie. What we see here are people lining up to see a movie called Life's Mirror by Lois Weber. That's, a, that's actually the film within the film called Idle Wives. And so it's, it's kind of a reflexive film in that regard. It reminds you that what you're looking at is a, is a film. And I find it kind of interesting that the movie, or the, the title that she chooses for this movie within the movie, Life's Mirror, is a kind of, a, kind of an echo of, of what we had learned about with that movie Hypocrites that she had made just uh, the previous year, that the idea of, of people not wanting to see themselves reflected in life smear. And uh, the, 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 the um, marquee poster you see in the lower right-hand corner, uh, that, that person we see there is her husband, uh, Philip Smalley. Uh, also, the same year, it's pretty amazing, the movie, I mean, basically turning out one feature film per month at this time in her career. She turned out a movie that dealt with capital punishment, another social issue, called The People versus John Doe. Um, it was originally released in November of 1916 under the title The Celebrated Stilo Case. Uh, there was an actual trial underway involving a person named Charles S Stilo uh, to avoid legal difficulties stemming from the ongoing true life case. Universal retitled the film The People vs. John Doe and released it uh, in November, just the next month. Uh, under this title. And you might wonder, what, what the heck does state rights mean? What does that mean? Uh, I'll explain it briefly. Uh, this was an advertisement directed to people in the movie business. Um, in other words, uh, what Universal was trying to do here is interest various distributors, film distributors across the country, uh, to pick up this film. And say it would not be unusual for a distributor to control the rights to say, um, theaters in Illinois or the upper Midwest or New England or something like that. And so uh, what, what Universal was hoping to do is sell the rights to the film to various distributors across the country. They, in turn, would have the right to negotiate these contracts with various theaters in their states or in their region. So that's all, that's all that, that means, in case you were wondering. Um, I do know I have to move along. Um, be not unusual for theaters to show slides, as we see here, as, as a kind of a coming attraction sort of thing. The idea of a what's called a trailer or a live action coming attraction hadn't really been developed yet. So instead of that, theaters, you know, prior to the showing of the main film, would throw up on their screen a slide kind of like this, and then there'd be a space on the bottom where they could indicate, you know, Roughly, when the movie was going to be appearing, so you know, uh, you know, as as people were waiting, you know, to, to you know for the main film to start, various slides, hand tinted slides like these would be, would be uh, projected. Um, here's um, a uh, magazine ad, I guess, or a newspaper ad for uh, another film she worked on called *The Mysterious Mrs. M*. Um, it, it tells the story, and, and it features the same Mary McLaren, who's been in a number of her movies by this point. Uh, you, you notice the reference to Bluebird. Bluebird was another brand name for Universal. And I, I think the, the thinking was back then that uh, if people, if they saw the name Bluebird, they would associate that with a certain quality of film, that this was considered a high quality type of film. And just about anything Weber was associated with was treated as a high quality film. So that would be a major selling point for these, for these movies if they were designated a Bluebird film. Still coming out of the Universal Studio but having this sort of individualized uh, uh, brand name. Um, Weber occasionally made movies that uh, were, were allegorical. Um, she didn't do too many of these kinds of movies but there would be movies sometimes where the, the performers would carry names like happiness, or in the case of this movie, there's a character named Wisdom, 
another character named Experience. Uh, Satan is personified. Um, this was called Even As You and I. This was not a box office hit. I don't think audiences were terribly um, intrigued by her efforts to create filmic allegories. This is another really beautiful um, hand-tinted ad for the, for the same film, uh, Even As You and I. And then this would have been a slide um, promoting the film. And here's uh, uh, an interesting film that Weber and her husband, Philip Smalley, worked on together. This would have been a 1917 movie called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Um, she had made Where Are My Children only the previous year, and it proved to be this huge box office hit. Uh, it only cost several thousand dollars to make, and it made at least three million dollars the first year. We're talking 1916, three million dollars. It was the Universal Studios' biggest hit, this movie I showed you before called Where Are My Children? And so I think Weber and Smalley were trying to capitalize on the success and popularity of that film by creating another birth control movie called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. This movie was very explicitly based on the experiences of Margaret Sanger and also Sanger's sister, Ethel Byrne, uh, in, in, in this regard. Uh, this, uh, Weber plays a woman who is married to a physician, and she can see the enormous difficulties, the enormous economic and other kinds of difficulties that are created when people don't have birth control information. Where people, and it really became kind of a class issue back then, the idea that um, upper class people had birth control information and they tended to have fairly small families, like maybe two or three children, whereas working class families and, and poorly educated families did not have access to birth control information. And we've all heard stories about you know, families with 10 children and 12 children, and, and how can you possibly pull yourself out of, out of the economic horrible situation that you find yourself in with such a large family like that. And she could see you know, the, the misery that the lack of birth control information was, was causing that film. Uh, that's the character she plays, and very much based on the, on the experiences of Margaret Sanger. And, uh, and um, Sanger herself, the same year, made her own birth control movie, simply called Birth Control. It was immediately censored. I don't think it ever received a public showing. I, I know she was, she was scheduled to show it in New York City, but the, the license commissioner in, in New York uh, shut it down immediately. At the same time, Weber and her husband were making this film, which kind of tells a similar story. Universal had a really powerful legal department and basically convinced a judge to put a restraining order on this license commissioner who was trying to ban the film. So this film got shown, but, but Sanger's did not. But, but the, the experiences that, that the Weber character play or has in this film, very much modeled after the experiences of Sanger. And I mentioned Ethel Byrne, who was Sanger's sister. Uh, Ethel Byrne, who was just as much of a birth control advocate as her sister, actually went on a hunger strike while, while incarcerated on, on Blackwell's Island. Uh, and in, in this movie, the, the Sanger-esque character goes on a hunger strike, too. So, I mean, this was kind of like a film ripped from the headlines uh, back then. And so that would have been a slide. And then um, this is another uh, publicity strategy that filmmakers sometimes used, that they would distribute handbills uh, to audiences coming in, like presumably uh, at this theater, the Criterion, we need in the lower left-hand corner, the Criterion Theater, which I tracked down to, to Bridgeton, New Jersey. Uh, presumably, they distributed this handout uh, maybe like a week ahead of the film's showing. And it's a, it's a double-sided handbill. Um, in fact, the, the back of it, like we saw before, has the complete text of, of you know, a, a summary of, it's a complete narrative summary of the film. So people would have this information in hand, lest the film undergo some, uh, some censorship. Okay, so that would have been the back side, and this would have been the, oops, and that's the, the, the front side of the hand that rocks the cradle. Around 1917, Weber became so prominent that she was able to form her own company 
Um, and uh, the first film that she produced on her own was called The Price of a Good Time, starring a person named Mildred Harris. And if the name Mildred Harris rings a bell, it's because she was at one time married to Charlie Chaplin. In fact, in some of the advertising for various films that she appeared in, she would sometimes be listed as Mrs. Charlie Chaplin. Uh, quite a bit young, she was quite a bit younger than uh, Chaplin. Um, so at this point in Weber's career, she was still associated with Universal, although she now had her own company called Lo Lois Weber Productions, but her films were released through Universal. And uh, what I find kind of interesting about this film um, it says something about the thinking of the time. Um, when this movie, um, see if I can find the reference to it really quickly. When this movie was shown in Newark, New Jersey, um, someone in the Newark Police Department thought that that title was too suggestive and ordered it shortened to the price. So as the film is being you know, advertised in newspapers and even on the theater marquee, it was called The Price because this person in the police department felt that was too suggestive of a title. Um, all right. And here's uh, Mildred again. I guess, as I recall in this, this is a movie that does not survive, but uh, my recollection of reading about it is that uh, she plays a, a shop girl who draws the attention of the wealthy son of the owner of the business where she works, and uh, she spends some time with him alone in his home, and they're witnessed by her brother, who tells everyone, and she is so mortified by that that she actually commits suicide. She throws herself in front of the, the son's car at the end of the film. It's a rather depressing film. Um, Doctor and the Woman is a film based on a novel simply called K by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Perhaps you're familiar with that. Um, it's about a mysterious guy who calls himself just by the letter K. We later learn that he's this famous physician who's been maligned by others and he develops a relationship with uh, um, the Mildred Harris character who works as a nurse there. I mean, basically it's another melodramatic kind of a kind of a film. There's a still image there, Doctor and the Woman. That would have been a slide, um, you know, uh, previewing it. Yet another slide for the same film. Here's some interesting images coming up here. <laughs> yeah, scandal mongers. Scandal monger. Um, in 1915, Weber and her husband made a film simply called Scandal, which took a look at the damage that's caused when people begin to gossip, when people begin to spread rumors about other people. And it has to do with a male business owner who takes his female secretary home and they're in the car together. People see them and they begin assuming all sorts of things. Basically, their reputations are ruined uh, by the end of the film. Um, the film was re-released, it was, I guess, such a popular film, it was re-released in 1918 under this new title, Scandal Mongers. And at the very, if you can see on the bottom, it says revised version of Lois Weber's film, Scandal. This is another image of it. It looks like something out of King Kong, doesn't it? Um, this, this would have been, this, this ad would have been 1918. Uh, and, and there's no literal monster present in the film. I mean, the monstrosity that's, that's depicted is scandalous behavior. I mean, basically people who are spreading lies and rumors about other people. That's really what uh, they're attempting to uh, depict there. And uh, here's another image of Mildred Harris in a bomb clothes. And uh, at, this po at this point, uh, yeah, here she's identified as Mrs. Charlie Chaplin. Um, at this point in, in Weber's career, she really had no stock company, where when she was working for Rex uh, early in her career, she, she was the head of her own company. She had her own crew, same actors every week. Uh, but now, you know, business practices were changing in Hollywood. And uh, at this point, in 1918, 1919, about there, thereabouts, um, Mildred was the only person under contract to her at that point, and then new performers would be brought in depending on the demands of the script. 
Here's a, I love this slide. It's, it's a, a kind of a vamp story called uh, To Please One Woman, where this uh, married woman uh, is bored with her husband and their marriage, and she begins trying to seduce some other guy. I mean, it's one of those fairly standard kind of uh, vamp stories. Here's another um, ad for the same for the same thing. By, by this point, she was still producing films under her own label, but now was releasing them through Paramount. You can see a reference to the Paramount Studios on the bottom there. A number of her films at this time were being released by, by that company. Uh, as is this film, Two Wise Wives. And by the way, a number of her films, a number of her films. I'm sorry? Paramount would have been Jesse Lasky, would have been the main uh, person back then. Um, and by the way, this movie is readily available online. Some of her, I mean, a lot of her films don't exist anymore, but a handful, handful still survive. If you go to YouTube and, and simply type in Lois Weber and the, the titles of some of these films, they will pop up. And I know this, this film survives in its entirety. I, I love this uh, uh, ad for the same thing with, with, with the owl motif uh, about these two women who know what to do when it comes to uh, their husbands. Uh, the Blot. I love the title of this film, The Blot. Uh, the, the, the title refers to uh, the shameful treatment that teachers and, and professors are, are given, and ma mainly in terms of how poorly they're paid. I can certainly relate to that, I guess. Uh, 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 and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, about this family who's, who's headed by a college professor who is, I mean, basically shown to be impoverished and many of his students are better off uh, than he is. Um, the young woman who's his daughter, played by an actress named Claire Windsor, um, works as a librarian. Uh, we see her here um, with a young, impoverished uh, minister who's attracted to her. And I think she's interested in him too, but, but you know, there's the, the economic difficulties are, are, are there. However, there's a young man um, who is quite well to do. You can tell just by the way he's dressed. It's a, uh, the character's played by an actor named Louis Calhern. He um, is the son of a wealthy business person in town here. And he's, um, uh, uh, he knows that the Claire Windsor character is working as a librarian. And he comes to know her, and he comes to know her family a little bit better. And everything has a way of working out at the end. But it's sort of like he, you know, he becomes enlightened about the economic difficulties that some folks in our society have. Um, here's another Claire Windsor movie uh, that Lois Weber directed called What Do Men Want? And uh, in, in this movie, it's uh, um, a restless young man um, marries the young woman we see here and later becomes a, a famous inventor. He becomes quite jaded, and he neglects his wife, and he neglects fatherhood. Um, he later suspects her of having an affair, and when he's proven wrong, everything works out nicely at the end. Um, so this, this would have been a film from uh, 1921. What I find kind of funny is that uh, the following year, another director at a different studio turned out a film that in some ways could be uh, part two titled, No Woman Knows, <laughs> as, as the answer to that question. I mean, she had nothing to do with that film, but, but it's, I think somebody was picking up on the question posed in the title of this film and coming up with a different answer. Um, she was back working with Carl Lemley. You'll see the name Carl Lemley there. She was back in the universal fold. She had, you know, basically her contract with Paramount was over, this would have been early 1920s. A uh, chapter in her life is kind of a Pollyannish kind of story about a uh, kind of a rich, crotchety kind of guy that we see standing in the middle there who uh, resents having his relatives live with him. Where they, he thinks they're kind of sponging off of him until he meets this young girl who we see on the left there who shows him a better way of thinking about life. And so it becomes a I, I think a Pollyanna would, would be a good way of labeling that kind of a, a film. She shows him the joy, and this is, I think this is, this is the character who plays her mom. Some film. Marriage Clause is uh, 
came out in the, in the mid to late 1920s. And um, so how am I doing for time? Ooh, I'm running a bit long. Um, I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, Marriage Clause came out in the 1920s. This was a huge hit for Universal. And it's about uh, a young woman played by uh, Billy Dove, who you see there, who has dreams of becoming a famous stage actress. Uh, but for her to continue, she's supposed to sign this agreement not to marry anyone uh, while she's in the midst of this contractual obligation. And so, it's, But apparently the movie is quite successful. I don't believe the movie survives, but uh, it was uh, successful enough for Weber to go ahead and make another feature film for Universal called The Sensation Seekers. This movie is readily available. Uh, if you go to archive.org and type in uh, Lois Weber, this, will, this film will come up. Uh, I have a couple, I think I have three or four slides for the same film. It's basically looking at the modern jazz age generation and the kind of trials and tribulations that they have. Some wonderful ads from the time. And there's a famous shipwreck scene in the film. In fact, one of the sailors on board was played by a bit actor named Walter Brennan. <laughs> you may remember him from The Real McGorries and a whole bunch of other movies. Before he became famous, he was basically a bit player in Hollywood films. He has a small part as a sailor uh, in this film. And then near the end, this is a, a movie called the, the Angel of Broadway, near the end of Weber's career. Uh, it, it focuses on a character that was, to some extent, modeled after herself. Before Weber hit it big, in the entertainment field, she actually worked as a church army worker, like around 1900, where she would literally preach from street corners. And the uh, church army is kind of similar to the Salvation Army. And in this movie, we have a young woman who's, I think she's meant to be a Broadway actress, and she wants to discover how lower class people live, and so she begins to attend uh, Salvation Army meetings, and she meets people, and learns the folly of her ways and so on. So I know we're, we're, we're definitely running out of time. So one way of wrapping things up, if I've piqued your interest in, in Lois Weber, I wanted you to know that later this year, uh, a book that I'm editing on her will be coming out simply called Lois Weber Interviews. It's an, it's an anthology of interviews that she granted. It's, it's a part of um, a book series that the University Press of Mississippi has called Conversations with Filmmakers. There are at least 40 books in this series. This will be one of the few books on a, on a female uh, filmmaker. And uh, it was a real challenge coming up with the, you know, because that meant searching through 100-year-old newspapers, but so much of this is digitized now, which made the job a little bit easier. So anyway, this book will be coming out later, later this year. So I think we're, I don't know, we probably don't have the time for anything. Here's what we're going to do. Okay. 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 So it's from that movie called Hypocrites that I mentioned uh, before. Hopefully, this will work. Okay. This is a scene that occurs about maybe thirty minutes into the film, um, where um, it's it's um, uh, where we see the young woman with the hand mirror uh, going about exposing people as they really are. So she takes on politicians in this, in this uh, unit. My platform is honesty. <laughs> so he seems like a, a decent guy, you know, somebody that you could support. And then we have this medieval monk from the other story up here along with the naked truth we'll see here up here and she has her hand mirror and now she's going to show what's really going on here what we see really going on here is this in as reflected in her mirror that's the circular shape there taking kickbacks from people basically what's happening here <laughs> 
<laughs> True. <laughs> and then we're back. So, you know, so that, that's her way of exposing what's really going on in this particular scene. Um, many other, I mean, we could cover this. Yes, right. I thought there's questions. Sure. Yeah, sure. 
people back then had very short memories when it came to the accomplishments of people who worked during the silent period. It's sort of like once synchronous sound was introduced in the late 20s, it seemed like people didn't really care about the accomplishments of silent era people. And, and when I mention uh, institutionalized sexism, here's what I'm getting at. In 1928, she wrote a really long article in which she talks about it, although you know, that, that term hadn't been invented yet. That particular ism hadn't been invented yet, but she said uh, she knew of many instances where if a man directed a movie and it failed at the box office, well, he'd probably get a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And she said, but if a woman's film tanks at the box office, she's done. She's, she's finished. And she said she had to waste so much time convincing the new crew people she was working with that she knew what she was doing. She had made hundreds of movies because basically what had happened is that early in her career when she was working for Rex, she worked with the same cast and the same crew every week. Everyone knew their place and so she was the head of her own unit. But starting around 1918, 1919, 1920 around there, a, a different way of making movies became more prominent. The idea that in her case, she would have to work with a completely different cast and crew for every film that she worked on. And many of the crew members had no idea who she was. You know, they didn't care about silent films, you know, um, or at least the earlier silent films that she had worked on. And she said she had to waste so much time showing them that she knew that she, <laughs> that, you know, I think the assumption was she's a woman, she doesn't know what she's doing. I think that was the, the working assumption back then. And she got fed up with that. And, and so in this article, she talks quite a bit about that kind of sexism from the lowest levels all the way to the top. And she was responding to a quotation from Jesse Lasky at the head of Paramount who said, and this is a, almost a verbatim quote, women do not make good directors. That was a, it was a direct quote from, from uh, Jesse Lasky, who she had worked for. I know she had clashed with him on a number of productions. And so I think in her case, it's a combination of things. I think the fact that people had short memories, they didn't really care what people had accomplished in 1908, and then also you know, the sexism that was coming in. But you're also right, I mean, that many other people had their careers uh, ruined. There were a lot of actors from non-English speaking countries who had come over to the United States, like Emil Jannings from Germany, who acted in some American movies during the silent period, but uh, spoke in heavily accented English, and, and his career as a sound film actor did not go anywhere, at least in, in this country anyway. Yeah, it'd be, it's an excellent idea. I mean, to put together a, a documentary, perhaps, on her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I totally agree. I, in, in fact, uh, I I'm, was pleasantly surprised early in my career to learn that in the years prior to World War I, there really wasn't a huge amount of sexism in the movie business back then. In fact, Weber herself said that as long as your movies did well at the box office, didn't matter what gender you were, you know? Uh, but things changed pretty radically during the 1920s. Um, I know of a film that's coming out on another early woman pioneer named Alice Guy Blachet, 
who made films in France in like in the 1890s, came over to the United States and formed her own company called Solax, which was, uh, which was uh, centered in Fort Lee, New Jersey for many years. There's a documentary coming out on her that's produced by Robert Redford and narrated to, by Jodie Foster. I think the movie's to be released sometime this year or early next. I happen to know about it because I was a consultant on it. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that uh, I, I, it sounds like you're talking about. I, yeah. I think the other side of that is that she's a very Yeah, in several senses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. In fact, there are pe there were people in the business who said the word female should be removed from that, that sentence you meant, but some people felt she was the greatest director, regardless of gender back then. Yes? No, she made films all through the 20s, and, uh, but, but uh, not as consistently as she had done. I think, I think the high point in her career is about 1916, 1917. And then she, I don't know, began losing some traction there. I know she made one sound film, uh, a movie called White Heat, which bears no connection to the Jimmy Cagney film. If you're familiar with that, that's not that film. In 1934, there was another movie called White Heat set in Hawaii that, that she directed. Unfortunately, it did not do well at the box office, and that's the kiss of death you know, for so many people. So she's she basically, basically a silent era Thank person. You. We're going to wrap it up now. Yeah. We've gone over. We've gone over. We'll I am so sorry. Minutes. So um, what we're going to do is we're just going to slide the next two programs back in two minutes. So we'll still have our break. Um, we'll go from 3 to 3.15, and then we'll start at 3.15 and we'll follow the rest. And if you have any more questions, you can come down yeah. and talk to sure. the party. Yeah. Thank you so much.